In the last video, we talked about the London underground scene and the, the groups that were more associated with that underground scene but didn't have the, the biggest commercial success. If they had commercial success, it was really only uh, in the UK. Now let's turn to some of the mainstream acts that were engaging uh, with psychedelia. We've already talked about the Beatles, so, and we've talked about how they, coming out of the UK, um, uh, how their career unfolds I into the end of the 1960s through 1969. Let's talk a minute about the Rolling Stones. Uh, it may be controversial with some of you, but I still think that in the 60s, uh, at least for most of the 60s until the very end, uh, at 68 or 69, the Rolling Stones remain the kind of junior partner to the Beatles. It's kind of the way it started out. The Beatles had the first big international success and the Rolling Stones follow. Uh, the groups were very friendly, but in many ways the Beatles, uh, I wouldn't say they overshadowed the Stones because the Stones were really, really big and really, really successful. But it's almost like it took the breakup of the Beatles uh, for um, the Ro Rolling Stones to really find their own voice. And once they did, uh, they, they really were uh, unlike any other group in many ways. And a good example of that is an album they brought out in December of 1967. It actually did pretty well for them, number two in this country, number three in the UK, called Their Satanic Majesty's Request. This album is often thought to be the Rolling Stones' response to Sgt. Pepper. A lot of critics don't like the album very much. I'll let you decide what you think about the album. Uh, it had a great cover with a holograph on it, so it's the Rolling Stones and these sort of like wizard hats, and there's a holograph there. It looks three-dimensional. Back in those days, that was really uh, high-tech uh, kind of stuff. What's interesting is that they even would think they had to respond to Sgt. Pepper. That tells you something about the relationship there. Um, well, you know, the Beatles have the flop with Magical Mystery Tour, and so to a certain extent, that's, that's very freeing uh, to the Rolling Stones, I think. It sort of frees them up. The album and the, the recordings around the Beggar's Banquet album from 1968, I mean, the tracks that are on Beggar's Banquet, Street Fighting Man, Sympathy for the Devil, really start to break free of the kind of following the Beatles kind of mold. This is the Rolling Stones that we really think of as being the, 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 the group that they developed into, into the 1970s. And I've done at the same sessions, but released at a single, was Jumpin' Jack Flash, number three in this country, number one in the UK in 1968. I think it's right about there that you really see the Rolling Stones sort of going off in their own direction. It's not really very psychedelic, but their Satanic Majesty's Request and some of the singles that surround that, She's a Rainbow, uh, uh, these things really do participate in the psychedelic uh, aesthetic mm, in 1967. By 68, they're moving away from it, as are the Beatles. Let's talk about Jimi Hendrix and Eric Clapton, the Jimi Hendrix Experience and Cream. Uh, these two groups, basically the same kind of formula, blues meets psychedelia, the same kind of uh, uh, stylistic approach there. But what's important about Clapton and Hendrix is that together they really develop the idea of virtuosity in rock music. That it's really important not just how I, how you, it's really important not just how you sing and how good the songs are, but how well you play. It can actually be important, more important to hear the guitar solo than to hear the vocal. This idea of virtue, and for the guitar solo to sort of do all kinds of things that nobody had imagined a rock guitar player being able to do. This kind of thing is what Clapton and Hendrix are responsible for building up in the period between 1966 uh, and 1969, the idea of the guitar hero. Let's talk for a minute about Jimi Hendrix, of course, born in Seattle. So we're talking about Hendrix coming out of the London scene, however, born in Seattle, toured around this country with a lot of groups, R&B groups, uh, uh, playing the circuit. Um, playing with people like Little Richard uh, and with the Isley Brothers. The one story that's often told about uh, his time, Jimmy's time with Little Richard is that he got kicked out of the band because he was taking too much attention from Little Richard. And Little Richard told him, there can only be one star in, that, in this show, buddy, and it's me. And so Hendrix had to go. Um, but by the time he was playing in the Cafe Wa in New York's Greenwich Village, um, he had already been a pretty experienced performer, and he was uh, uh, seen playing there by Chas Chandler, who had been the bass player in The Animals, but was now thinking he wanted to get into management and offered to manage Jimi Hendrix if he would move uh, back to London and launch his career there, because that's where Chas uh, had all of his connections. Um, the story is that Jimmy was very interested to, in the idea and asked Chas, said to Chas Chandler, I'll do it if you can introduce me to Eric Clapton. Now, who knows whether that's a story that comes up later or whatever, but that's the way the story is often told. And I, I, uh, I 
tell it now to give us some, some indication that there was a mutual respect between Jimi Hendrix and Eric Clapton. They liked each other very much. They admired each other's playing. Uh, and so it was this kind of friendly competition that really continually sort of raised the bar. And we can, we'll talk about that in just a minute, how that happens. Uh, if we're looking for the Jimi Hendrix experience, the, the group that they put together, Mitch Mitchell on drums, Noel Redding on bass, though he'd never been a bass player before. He'd mostly been a folk singer playing acoustic guitar. If you think about that three-piece group, uh, Jimmy, Mitch, and Noel, their blues and pop numbers are probably best exemplified by tracks like Purple Haze or Foxy Lady. Some of the more experimental kind of trippy numbers would be things like If Six Was Nine or 1983, A Merman, I Should Turn To Be. As you look through the three albums they did together, uh, you'll find both kind of blues, traditional blues kinds of things, poppy kind of radio single kinds of things, and then experimental uh, stuff that sort of really engages in the psychedelic use of the recording studio as a kind of instrument uh, uh, in and of itself. Now we turn to Cream and Eric Clapton, bringing Eric Clapton, who already had a reputation for being one of England's best guitarists, uh, together with bassist and singer Jack Bruce and drummer Ginger Baker in July of 1966. Kind of thought of initially as a kind of a super group, although probably Clapton was at that time probably more super uh, than the other two. Um, they used traditional blues a lot. In fact, Eric Clapton was a great advocate of traditional blues playing in many ways, revived the careers and the reputations of a lot of musicians who were in danger of being forgotten. Uh, they did tracks by Robert Johnson, Crossroads Blues, uh, Muddy Waters, Rollin' and Tumblin'. A lot of times these tunes would, would, would feature really extended solos where Eric would go on and on. This comes out of a tradition he, they used to have with the Yardbirds when he played in that band where they would sort of go into these long solos at the end. They called them rave ups. A good example of that is their live version of Spoonful, uh, a, a Willie Dixon tune. Uh, a pop element there as well, mostly uh, via Jack Bruce, uh, pop singles like I Feel Fine and A Strange Brew. Now, if you take the six albums released by Cream, uh, by Cream and Hendrix together, and the Hendrix experience together, and I guess we'll be putting these probably up uh, behind me on the board as this goes by, it'll make it easier for you to see. They're actually interleaved in terms of release, with the Cream albums coming first and the Jimi Hendrix albums uh, coming, Hendrix Experience albums coming after that. And as you see that, as they come in pairs, you'll see that, and you listen to those records, if you would listen to them in sequence, what you would hear is that they continually raise the bar for ambition, experience, you know, experimenting in the studio and general sort of level of virtuosity. We start out with Fresh Cream in December of 1966, answered with Are You Experienced in May of 1967. We get Disraeli Gears in November of 1967, which is answered by Hendrix's Axis Bold as Love in December of 1967. We get from Cream Wheels of Fire in July of 1968, followed by Hendrix's Electric Ladyland in October of 1968. It's a very neat little package, and by the time you get to the sixth one of those albums, sort of going back and forth between the two groups, you've got the guitar hero, the way it continues to be, um, uh, uh, the tradition that continues to be honored within the 70s, 80s, and into the present day. So these two guys together uh, really made that happen. Again, mainstream artists, this all happened uh, very much in public view, although in many ways it took Hendrix playing the Monterey Festival and touring over in this country to reintroduce himself to American audiences. He was initially much more successful in the UK than he was in America. Um, other British acts that we should think about uh, on the, in the British mainstream that engaged uh, psychedelia, a Traffic, the group that Stevie Winwood got into uh, after he left uh, the Spencer Davis group, had a number five hit with Paper Sun, which is a beautiful piece of pop psychedelia. Van Morrison, uh, first with his group Them, recorded the classic track Gloria, but as a solo artist, Brown Eyed Girl, not very psychedelic that one. but. The 1968 album Astral Weeks is usually thought of as classic Van Morrison uh, and a very important album, especially by Van Morrison fans from, uh, from this period. Donovan, kind of England's, initially in, in the mid-60s, England's answer to Bob Dylan um, had some great sort of uh, whimsical uh, pop hits in 1966. Sunshine Superman was number one in this country. Mellow Yellow was number two in this country, but probably the most sort of psychedelic folk tune, the one that sort of most embraces this idea of what psychedelia was that comes from Donovan, is a track from 1969 called 
Atlantis uh, was a number seven hit here and tells the whole story about the lost city of Atlantis with narration and it's very psychedelic. Another interesting thing about those Donovan tracks is in the years before Jimmy Page and John Paul Jones played together in Led Zeppelin, Jimmy and, and John Paul Jones both were on Donovan sessions and there's actually, I think there's one Donovan track where most of Led Zeppelin aside from Robert Plant is there, so three of the four of them are there together. Um, well that gives us some idea of what was happening in the London scene uh, during this period, but London and San Francisco were not the only scenes that we need to think about when we think about psychedelia. So in the next video, we're going to talk about what was happening in Los Angeles and elsewhere.